Oh, Coach Paul Woody from the Times Dispatch in Richmond. Can you talk a little bit about what Justin Robinson means to the team, what he means to you, how you talk to him, how he talks to you? I think the our language has evolved uh, as our relationship has deepened. Um, probably less words than maybe five years ago. Less words are required. I think he's done an unbelievable job, near perfect in representing our program on and off the floor. I think his growth as a player probably parallels the growth of our program during his time here. Raised, uh, I've learned so much from his parents on how to be a better parent. Uh, obviously my relationship with both of his parents is in my opinion extraordinary as a head coach for sure. Um, He's, he's easy to cheer for. He's easy to love. He has not always been easy to coach. I think he has become more coachable as his understanding of what we're trying to do has improved to the point now that he is semi-coaching on his own. And I think that I hope that this year is his best year yet. I think if you look at what uh, what the program was upon his arrival and what the program is today, I don't think that there's anything easy about that, particularly when, to use a football term, he's been the quarterback. Played 101 games, I think. He started 85 games. He's averaged over 10 and a half points throughout his career. He's played 28.4 minutes in his career. He was second in the best league in the country in assists last year. Um, shot 40% from three. I think, uh, I don't mean it in a derogatory way at all. I think all of that stuff is really, really hard to do. Mike, well, it seems like every year when you're in here, you talk about uh, either inexperience or youth. And you got some older guys now. Do you change the way you coach, you deal with them because of the makeup? Yeah, I would say I'm a lot harder. Um, they understand the path to this point. And I think to maybe pat them on the back because they're old or coach them less intense is a disservice to who they need to become as players, but also who they need to become as people. It's for sure the oldest we've been since we've been here. Um, that speaks to if you look at the first recruiting class, 5, K, Chris in the early period, and Ty was in the spring of our first recruiting class. So to have those guys obviously is, is rare anymore at this level. And then Ahmed was here before them. And so um, all of the red shirts and the injuries and things like that always play into it. but. To have a roster this old, to have been a part of building what they've built, and you still have that high of a return relative to they're still here, I think is really good. What, what changes for you? Is it the way you run practice? Is it in-game, a combination? Yeah, I don't know. We haven't started practice yet. Um, we'll start practice tomorrow. I, I think um, maybe it's – the next layer of teaching, because so much of what we've done offensively, they understand. We made the drastic change defensively with 10 games remaining last season. We've spent some time on that in our what we call team workouts in September. We had four of those. So kind of the base knowledge for those guys that we're talking about with experience, they already know that. And so we're kind of to the next level. I think it'll end up being a balance of pushing those guys while making sure we're properly educating those without that level of experience. Buzz, you mentioned defense. Justin said when, when he was in here earlier that you guys had a film session where you pointed out to them how much Devin and Justin Bibbs yeah. covered up some things defensively last year. Yeah. Who in your mind is the most or are the most likely people to give you that defensive edge this season? Uh, KJ's probably the most um, 
the one with the most evidence that he can overcome some mistakes in front of him. I don't know that any player I've ever coached has the defensive instincts that Devin did. Um, Bibbs had that uh, degree of instincts, but as his career unfolded, I think it continued to improve. Making that wholesale change the way that we did is probably it's, – it's not what you want to do as a coach. Um, our offensive numbers, as you know, at that point were stellar in many regards. Our defensive numbers were what they had always been, if not slightly below. And I thought it was the only chance that we had – maybe to do better and I don't know who on our current team will be able to do what Bibbs and Devin did. Uh, I think we can figure out what they gave us offensively but who is going to be able to maybe right or wrong in front of them I don't know yet. I think all of them having a better understanding and more reps hopefully helps somebody come to the forefront. But thus far, we don't have evidence of that. Uh, high expectations for the team this year. Uh, what in the next month will you be looking at in practice to kind of give you an idea of whether, yes, we'll be improved enough in this area or that area that this can be an even better team than it was last year? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I don't, I'm never good at those questions, as you know. I don't mean that as a uh, contrarian. I, I'll look at the same things that I always look at. Are we better today than we were yesterday? Uh, our timeline has been the same. We did one less individual workout in September than we typically do because I thought that they were ahead. Um, we did two less boot camp sessions, which in general – means one less day. Uh, they've been off since Saturday. So the flow of what we've done thus far, Berman, has been the same. Um, we'll practice five times over the weekend in the woods. I think their understanding of what we're trying to do defensively is much better. All that we've done as a team in the four hours we've worked as a team has been defensive-based. We've done zero offense at all. Um, I think we'll maybe do some offense maybe in the Saturday evening practice, but how I coach them um, and will I be able to have a better gauge when I see in Charlotte, I don't know. I, I think my answer will be the same. We just got to keep going, got to keep getting better. The last time we saw Ty, he was knocking down shots from Roto. Consistency. Yeah. Um, I don't. I guess Justin was saying that in recent pickup games he's looked like the old tie. Um, yeah. With such a long layoff, do you expect him to just kind of pick up where he left off, and how does he kind of advance his game a little bit? Yeah. Um, he's a little leaner than the last time you saw him. He's probably the most mature adult. He should probably be on our staff as opposed to on our team. He just processes things at, um, better than most of us in this room. Tell him one thing, he does it, he researches it on his own, he studies it before he asks you a question. Um, when he missed the first year, I thought there was significant rust the rust fell off, obviously, when Chris got hurt. And you can easily argue that who Ty became in those nine games determined that we went to the NCAA tournament for the first time in 13 years. During the first year that he set out, as you know, he couldn't sweat. I think that contributed to the rust. He was released from the doctors from his ACL rehab faster than Adrian Peterson, who I think is arguably one of the best athletes ever. He's just, uh, if you say do it, then he's for sure going to do it at least double that amount. So I hope that the rust is not as prevalent 
as it was the first time. Obviously, he's a year older. He's had a rep of sitting out. When he has 10 toes to the rim and just a little bit of space, when he shoots, you think it's basket. Um, when he doesn't have 10 toes to the rim or maybe he has to work too hard to get to that space, it's not near as pretty, but it's still fairly accurate. I just think his ability to shoot at the rate that he shoots changes our team from a spacing standpoint. And I think what we'll have to figure out how to do that we haven't had to thus far with this roster is how can we be effective with Chris and Ty in the game. Those kids have never played together. And those two guys both give us some level of size, some level of length, and for sure uh, not symmetrical games, but two games that go and blend very well. So all of us are excited that Ty's back. You referenced last season's offensive numbers a, f a few minutes ago. One of the maybe unseen numbers was you were seventh in the country in two-point percentage. Yes, sir. How much of that was five? How much was it the three-point threat creating angles in space? Uh, yeah. I, I, until I would have to say, you know, like um, the short answer would be both. One of the things we do in the summer, uh, I did it with Ty. I didn't study Ty this summer because he didn't play last year, but I did it uh, before we started recruiting in September. How many shots did Ty shoot in his what was red shirt junior year, and where did those shots come from? Was it the play or was it the player that had the ball before Ty had it, or was it? Not the play, not the player before Ty had it. It was when Ty got it. And we do that on every play, er, and every play. The thing that I would say about Ty is no matter who guards him, they're going to shade him as a shooter. I think that's why our effective field goal was so good was because – you, when you look at our team, maybe not as a coach, but when you just look at our team and our roster, you go, wow, they're uh, going to shoot a bunch of threes. They're fast. They're going to get obliterated on the glass. And um, hopefully they make a lot of free throws. I don't think we've done a great job making a lot of free throws. We've been okay, not great. But our two-point field goal percentage is partly because of our shot selection. It's partly because of the space that we play with. And for sure, some of it comes from five and is a byproduct of five. But I would have to say it's both. Coach, a uh, five, if I may call him that. Then, uh, you can. Thank you. Thank you. He, yeah, he wears a necklace now, and it's all, there's all kind of stuff. It's, it's five. He'll have a tattoo probably before it's over. Well, you're number one, so that's what matters. Um, Paul, thanks. You come once a year. Whoa, 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 whoa. Twice. When we play Virginia in media day. Well, at the UNC game, you said, who are you again? I know. I, I don't read the paper, so I, but I appreciate your professionalism. Well, I appreciate that. And we are online, so you can grab us anytime. <laughs> we'll look it up on Twitter as soon as we're done. So Five said that when you and he talk, uh, it's 5% basketball, 95% life. That sometimes he has to ask you to be tougher on him, uh, just like you were as a freshman. Yep. So are those two first two things true, and do you find you have maybe a soft spot for five in your heart? I, um, I would say uh, he just gave you the 5%. I, I don't spend uh, a lot of time talking to any of our guys about basketball. Um I'm not saying that that's right. I'm not saying that's wrong. I text five, Chris, Ty, Med in the August time period when they were gone home. So it's, it's the quietest time of the year at Virginia Tech men's basketball when 
Summer session two is over. It's the longest period of time they're never on campus. And I told them in the text that I needed them to hold me accountable to push them harder because I have such genuine love for who they are, for their story prior to arrival here, and how their story has blossomed, that I do believe as a human, I have a soft spot towards all of those guys. And at times, I don't do a great job, arguably I don't do a good job being their basketball coach because my relationship with them has always had precedence and I have done a better job thus far through the 11 individual workouts at holding them accountable. And one thing that I've learned and it speaks to their character, when they catch me not holding them accountable, they say, coach, that wasn't right. And they're not talking about me. They're talking about me and whatever their action was. And I say, you're right. Do it again. But it's not just five. It's particularly five and Chris. Ahmed is not as vocal as five or Chris. But he's been doing it longer. So those guys know. And that's one thing that I will have to be better at is making sure that I'm coaching them as much as I'm loving them. And maybe I can do both. Chris, what can you tell us about your freshmen, uh, Wilkins, Cabongo, and Nolly? Uh, I like what they've done so far. Um, of course, individual workouts they think is going to be a lot of shooting and dribbling, and it's no dribbling and every now and then a shot. Um I think the month of September is hard when you're a newcomer, regardless of your age. I think our upperclassmen have done an elite level job of preparing them prior to me walking in the gym. And then maybe at times accepting the brunt of whatever I'm saying or doing to protect those guys. Um, they're excited to practice. They were more than excited to finish boot camp. Uh, everybody's excited to finish boot camp, but I think they felt as though without articulating it, we kept up with these guys and we made it. And I think that uh, that's always a good, I hope it's a good sign going into practice. Mike, you've certainly shown in your tenure here that you'll, you'll change what you're doing based on how things are playing out. Yeah. Are you going into this year expecting to be the zone team we saw at the end of the half, the man-to-man -man team that we saw earlier in your time? Are you undecided? Do you have a good vision of that? Yeah. Uh, we were talking as a staff maybe in July before we went on the road, and I was trying to articulate, in my opinion, how monumental it was that we completely – threw away everything we had done defensively after Miami beat us. And it was the only time in my career as a coach that I don't have a practice plan. I have every practice plan, not just as a head coach, but as an assistant coach. From that Sunday until Alabama beat us, I never had a practice plan because we literally did the same thing every day. And it was almost um, – a very gradual increase slash adjustment slash an adaptation defensively to what we had learned the previous day because it was all brand new. Our kids, I thought, were phenomenal in that. Going into this season, all of our prep in the film room, what we have done in the four-team workouts has been towards how we close down the season defensively. I'm curious, we've done some research, I'm curious if within how we play defensively, as teams adjust to that becoming a steady diet, how can we make tweaks to that relative to the opponent, relative to ball screen coverage, 
relative even to personnel. I don't have the answer to that yet. But as of today, that's, that's how I would answer it. Um, uh, for this team to take a step and, and be even better than it was last year, what aspect of, of the team do you think needs to improve? And also, uh, since you've had an eventful offseason, is there any light you can shed on kind of uh, why Rock and Jeff left, why Hadim's not here anymore, and, and why McAllister uh, changed his mind? Yes, um, I can't speak on those prospects. That's against the NCAA rules. Uh, really excited for all of the adults that were on our staff. Um, thankful in many layers, many facets for who those guys were. Um, I was shocked, to be honest, that prior to the end of year four, we had only had one departure, considering what had transpired here. I think it bodes so well for Virginia Tech. It bodes well for what our players and our staff have done during our time here. Um, Ernest is one of 30 in the world now. Uh, he had been with me for 10 years. That's incredibly rare, all 10 years at the Power 5 level. Jeff had been with us for six years, uh, had a distinct increase in pay and a promotion in title. Um, have a great relationship with Billy. Obviously, Chu is there. So it was for Coach to be in the position that he has been in over the last six years and for it to turn into that. Uh, I think that'll maybe reinvigorate the end of his career as a coach. I think that's a really cool story. I think he'll have a distinct impact uh, in Aggie land. So happy for Rock. You know, Rock's my best friend. He was the first Division One coach that I ever met. I was 17 years old. I wrote him every week of my college career, and I grew up dreaming that I would work for him. Uh, he was offered and accepted a Division One job and was quarantined in the hotel. Press conference was the next morning at 10, and he found out at 8 he wasn't getting the job. And I still got the assistant's job at that school. I tried to hire him at Marquette. He was the head coach at Lamar at that time. It just never worked. The timing that he was able to come here Obviously, his son moved here. Son graduated from high school. So thankful for everything that he did uh, and for our relationship. So real excited about all of those guys. Just as excited that because of those changes, we were able to promote from within a couple of guys, guys that have been with us for a long time. It's the next right step in their career. I just think that that speaks to, you know, we spend so much time focusing on the players, and we should. But there's also a group of guys that are trying to improve their career and improve their life and improve their income and uh, their trajectory. And so to be able to work in both groups, uh, maybe I'm getting old, but I think that's really cool, and I think that's what I'm supposed to do. So, I, but I can't answer on the guys that are prospects. He took another job. He's the head. Why, would he, why did he want to go from here to East Carolina? I think he thought it was the a better opportunity. And uh, for a guy that resigned as a head coach in Division I, um, it's hard for me to argue. Final question here to Norm. About uh, six or seven games in the ACC slate last year, Matt kind of hit a wall. His minutes suffered after that. I don't know if it was because of an injury or something was going on off the floor or – Maybe you can shed some light on that. And can he kind of recapture what he had there early in the season? And, and have you seen steps toward that? Yeah, he's been great. Um, it was his struggles began offensively two and a half games prior to the loss against Miami. And then the wholesale defensive changes did not help Med because it those changes forced us to – to an extent, Devin and Med exchange minutes, swap minutes. And it also, to an extent, gave Bibbs maybe three to four more minutes per game. So it was the combination of the two. 
that change was uh, it was not easy for anybody. But I think uh, Bibbs and Devon's instinct probably gave them more minutes early because we just completely pushed the chips in on how we were going to play. Um, Med didn't close down the year great, not because of the offensive numbers, but because of the changes defensively. But it was not simultaneously, but in the same package of time is when that happened. But he's been superb. Thank you, Coach. You bet.